Hello everyone, hope you're all doing well. Today we will be analyzing The Pride of Lions by Joanna Preston. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Unlike my analysis of The Mountain by Elizabeth Bishop, this analysis will be less of me theorizing different things and more about trying to pull out different points from the poem as it will save time and will allow you to come up with your own ideas to justify different points regarding the usage of certain words and punctuation without limiting yourself to my theories and ideas. Okay, so first I'll analyze and explain different things that stand out and at the end I'll give you examples of theories you can relate this poem to. This video is divided into four parts. Firstly, we will analyze the title of the poem. Secondly, we will read it out loud. Thirdly, we will analyze it stanza by stanza. And lastly, I'll be discussing different theories you may apply to the poem and give you a few tips. Before we do anything, the first thing one notices when they look at this poem is that there is no fixed length of stanzas. It all seems chaotic and not at all aesthetically pleasing. So the first impression has already been made through this and you don't get the best feeling as you dive into the poem. Now to analyze the title, The Pride of Lions. This is surely an interesting title for a poem considering there is an evident use of the pun on the word pride. Either it could mean ego or it could mean a group of lions which is called a pride. But when you begin reading the poem with the expectation of a group of lions, even if the lions are symbolic of a certain type of people, your expectation is not entertained. There is only a persona and her fiancé leaving room for our first assumption, the ego of lions. Another thing to note is that lions are creatures that are on the extreme ends of the survival spectrum. Either they are at the top of the group and of their food chain, or they are dead. There is no in-between. Bear that in mind when you analyze the poem. Now let's read the entire thing. The Pride of Lions by Joanna Preston But before we could marry, he became a lion, thick pelted and rich with the musk of beast. The switch to all fours was not easy, all his weight slung from the blades of his shoulders. His deltoids knotted like teak pearls, and I burnished them as he slept. Burrs matted his mane, and for days he wouldn't let me groom him, slapped me away with a sued paw, snarled against my throat. He would not eat fruit or drink milk, but tore meat from the bones I provided. His claws caught in the carpet, so I stripped the rugs from the floor and polished the boards until they gleamed and rang with the chime of his nails. I stroke his saffron hide and tangle my fingers deep in his ruff, draw him around me, ardent as the gleam of his topaz eyes. The hypnotic lash of his tail, the rasp of his tongue on my thighs. Now I will be analyzing the poem. But before we could marry. The poem starts off with a but. So you immediately know there's a conflict here. There's a pause after Mary. And if I was reading the poem for the first time, I would have thought she's going to say she found out he was cheating on her or something. And then the persona just flips the entire thing around, making you just scratch your head. He became a lion. Became is a definitive word which is why the pause at the end of the line indicated by the dash shows you the sense of finality accompanying this claim. Now, if you're like me, when you read this, you're going to say, excuse me, what? I need to know the context for this to make sense. And it gets even weirder as we move on and hopefully my theories at the end may clear up confusions. Moving on, thick pelted, and rich with the musk of beasts. Thick pelted could mean this person 
who seemingly turned into a lion is well guarded, emanating an aura of authority. Do note this phrase is enclosed in pauses, which creates dramatic effect. The word rich could be used in a number of ways, list down all the ways it could be used in, and try using it to draw out other theories. Through the word musk, you can tell the persona is exploring the territorial nature of men, which is complemented by the noun beast, and this in turn explores the bestial nature of men. The switch to all fours was not easy. The word switch shows you the quick transition from man to beast, signifying the presence of some external force that desires an instant change from the beloved. The poem takes a weird turn, for you see the persona sympathizing with the beloved when she says, it was not easy. And there is a pause which shows that she thinks about it and perhaps even empathizes as she imagines the pain he goes through. You know what? That's fine. I understand everyone's partner tries to put themselves in the other's shoes and see things from their perspective. But later on in the poem, when you see the violent behavior of the beloved towards the persona, you are left wondering, why is she sympathizing slash empathizing? All his weight slung from the blades of his shoulders. The weight could be certain demands that have to be met, and the blades create sensory imagery, making you feel the pain the persona claims her beloved goes through. His deltoids knotted like teak burls. I googled what deltoid means, and it says, a thick triangular muscle covering the shoulder joint and used for raising the arm away from the body. So this shows that this change in him is not something he can control, it's something that was built in. Now the question is, what environmental or emotional factors have led us to this conclusion? And the idea of parts of you knotting up is actually very terrifying, because you can't imagine the extent of pain. If you aren't entirely sure, what it must look like to have knotted skin, just imagine the elephant man. You will easily be able to see the sheer pain and horror of this abnormality that the beloved has to go through. And I burnished them as he slept. The verb burnish may show she has to work in accordance with her lover, highlighting her docile nature as she also suggests it is not easy for him either due to some external force compelling him to be that way. Burrs matted his mane. A burr is an unwanted rough edge or ridge left on an object, so this gives the picture that the lover is disheveled, and this could be descriptive of his outer appearance, or mental state, or both. And for days he wouldn't let me groom him. You see, the persona is trying to tame him, bringing in the idea of the taming of the shrew. The lover does not seem too keen about it, and it seems the persona feels deprived of this opportunity to somehow improve the lifestyle of the beloved. The pause at the end may show the beloved and the persona both know he cannot be helped. Slapped me away with a sued paw, snarled against my throat. The two lines give the idea of domestic violence, making it very painful for the reader to go through these words. They show you the power dynamics between the persona and her lover and how threatening the beloved is. He would not eat fruit or drink milk, but tore meat from the bones I provided. This small stanza gives us a glimpse of the persona trying to tame the beloved, which is contrasted to the animalistic nature of the beloved we observe through the verb tor. You can also see a sense of resentment when the persona mentions I provided, hinting to the idea she is also possessive of the beloved and wants to change him, perhaps wanting us to identify this aspect of this relationship in which she attempts to assert dominance over the beloved. His claws caught in the carpet, 
the alliteration of C in claws, cot, and carpet brings in the possibility of the persona choking on this toxic relationship due to the beloved's harsh and arrogant attitude. The pause gives the idea the beloved is staring at her with an accusatory expression. It brings a feeling of suspense. At this point, the reader might be worried the beloved's claws getting caught will infuriate him and the persona is used as his outlet for negative emotions. So I stripped the rugs from the floor. The word stripped itself is harsh and may have sexual connotations due to the nakedness it stresses upon, so you may theorize with that aspect in mind. You are once more shown the persona's docile and cooperative nature. And polished the boards until they gleamed. Now through this line it is evident the persona is investing a lot of time in the relationship perhaps hoping the relationship may somehow turn towards a more positive path if she puts in enough effort by leaving priorities of her own, and rang with the chime of his nails. The word rang brings forth a feeling of dread, a sense of alarm. This declaration of presence is like alerting or warning the persona and the reader that the predator is here. The lack of pauses throughout the stanza may show a sense of panic and frenzy taking over the persona, making her speak in a rushed manner without any pauses. I stroke his saffron hide and tangle my fingers deep in his ruff. In this stanza, it's evident there is a shift in tense. From the past, we are brought to the present and we see the relationship of the persona and the beloved has changed. It does not seem as toxic by the way the beloved is welcoming the persona's affection, but we must also question is this because she is successful in taming him and thus taking control, or has he made her as violent and malignant as him so that their ugliness complements each other? Drew him up around me, ardent as the gleam of his topaz eyes. These two lines convey the same message of the persona and the beloved enjoying each other's company. The phrase, drew him up around me, shows you the persona is ready to become a part of the beloved. She feels safe and loved around him and wants to keep him with her. But through Topaz's eyes, you are told it is not because she was able to successfully tame him. Rather, it shows she has failed and the beloved is still the cold-hearted person we had judged him to be. Plus, the topaz eyes also bring the sort of stony approach where the beloved demands his carnal urges to be satisfied. And since gleam is usually associated with happiness, the use of this noun makes it seem like the predator has found its prey or perhaps seized it, hence the happiness. The hypnotic lash of his tail the rasp of his tongue on my thighs. Through these two lines, it is evident the persona is discussing the carnal aspect of the relationship, highlighting the idea of this unstoppable sexual chemistry and the concept of pleasure comes to pain exploited by the use of commas. What you need to do now is go over everything I've said and try to draw out theories. For example, if I've said the pauses create dramatic effect, you're going to ask yourself why. Why is there a pause? Is the persona perhaps being silenced? Is she unable to breathe because these emotions are overwhelming? What emotions are these specifically? Keep branching it out like how I have talked about the concept of a web in my video on how to study literature. Don't stop branching out until you feel like you have exhausted your mental capacity. Okay, so I jotted down a couple of questions before analyzing. I think I answered a few of them. You may figure out the rest yourself, theorize and look for evidence supporting your theories. So there are six questions. Number one, why has she immediately accepted his conversion into a lion? Secondly, in the title, there is the pride, but all we can see are the persona and the lion. Where is the pride? Number three, why has she readjusted her life for him? Number four, why is there a change of tense in the second paragraph? Number five, 
Why does she empathize? Number six. What is the persona trying to say in the poem? Okay, so remember how I said I will be giving you a couple of theories? So I have three theories on what is going on. The first is that the persona has realized she has fallen into the trap of submission set up by the beloved. He showed his true colors by acting like a typical male chauvinist as he made her tend to his needs, hence showing himself as the more powerful and controlling power of the relationship. Another could be that during the courtship, or at least at the very end, she realized that the beloved was an uncouth person whom she tries to slowly tame and mellow down into a perfect gentleman, teaching him table manners and taking his unruly hair something like Taming of the Shrew or Beauty and the Beast. Thirdly, in a number of places where I have used the term external force, this external force, in my opinion, could be the society. While reading the poem, you see the idea of the beloved and the persona living in a sort of backward male-dominating society in which a woman is supposed to be submissive and allow her husband to do what he wants to do with her. So this idea can be seen in the terms that the man in the relationship is supposed to be the dominating power and the woman is supposed to accept that. The society's norms force men into becoming vicious creatures who treat their wives in an unjust manner. So this transformation of the beloved into a lion is not only painful for the persona, but for the beloved as well. For he may not have wanted to be like this. He may have wanted to love and cherish the persona, but is forced by the society to become a beast. The persona understands his reasons. Hence, she readjusts her life in a way that would suit the beloved and pretends as if what is happening is not wrong. Now that I have concluded my stanza by stanza analysis, what you need to do now is to go through the poem on your own. If at any point in the analysis you disagreed with what I had to say, that's brilliant. Write down what you think should be the case instead of what I said. Look for proof to support your argument. You may write it down in the comment section or you could discuss it with someone, whatever suits you. I would advise you to go through the poem on your own now and make your own notes. After making your notes, tally them with mine. If there is something you missed out on, write it down. If there is something I missed out on, mention it in the comment section. The best thing for you to do right now would be to write an entire essay on what you just picked up. I know how horrible it sounds, but you have to ensure none of those amazing ideas bouncing in your head this instant go away before you get a chance to document them. I know although this is a stanza by stanza analysis, it does not incorporate comments on every single thing. But consider this as just a sort of guideline explaining how to approach a reference to context or comment based question. If you like the video, do let me know as it will surely brighten my day. If you have any constructive criticism regarding the manner I have made this video, make sure to let me know for it will help me improve my content. Share this video with someone who might need the help. A like and a subscribe would be very helpful. Take care. Bye.